Thank you, Marco. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about advertising as this session, or I'm not going to talk very much about advertising. But, well, let me actually start by um, saying uh, an awful lot of people at, thought I would never leave the University of Texas and asked me why I left. And this is an email that the people who run the University of Texas sent out. Um, your last name is your password. If you have any questions or you've forgotten your password, please contact the coordinating board. So I thought by going into the tech sector, I might actually kind of avoid this sort of idiocy. So this is from one of my former employers, um, self-assessment. Type in your name. What's your relationship to the person noted above? The good thing is, is that they say self need not answer the question below. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you which company, but it was before Microsoft. So. so uh, uh, as Marco noted, I want to uh, respond a little bit to what Hal had to say. Uh, let me first start by just putting out for you the structure of Hal's remarks. So he says, I'm going to talk to you about data scale effects in search. He then talks about root end precision, and that's a point where I completely agree with him. Root end precision is something that, that is a feature of every machine learning theorem. Uh, in fact, what they say, that it's provably the best you can do, and any good algorithm meets root end. So, so, uh, so, so they all have that feature, because if they didn't, if you had one that, was, uh, that wasn't root end, it would be worse than root n, in which case you could do better, at least at scale. He then told us a bunch of entertaining Microsoft anecdotes, none of which had anything to do with scale. And then he concludes, this by the way is the, uh, is the um, Italian word for end, but it could have another meaning. Uh, okay, so here's the structure of my remarks. Um, so I'm going to tell some entertaining Google anecdotes unrelated to search scale, uh, just because that seems to be de rigueur. And then I'm going to give some insight into roses. And then I'm going to talk about data scale effects in search, which was both Hal's and my topic. Uh, I'll give a little background on this, talk about dynamic machine learning. I want to tell you about the knowledge graph which we constructed. And then uh, and I'll show some uh, ranking improvements. And then hopefully I won't get fined. Uh, entertainment. Um, so, so if you search Google fail, there are 215 million results. Microsoft, there are only 72 million. <laughs> search for search engine that is better than Google, and there are 176 million results. <laughs> This is a, a Google search result from the day that Michael Jackson died. And what you see is that he died at age 65 in London. You can go check Wikipedia. That is not, in fact, correct. Um, this is Red Roses in Birmingham, Al. And you see Google has, oh, you can't see them all, but they have 11 ads. Uh, one of which is actually in the UK. To be fair, I searched this here in Italy, so that's not quite as stupid as it might be if I searched it in the US. Uh, but there are 11 ads there. And um, if I actually do what was the original query, which is Red Roses in Birmingham, Alabama, I only get three ads. I don't actually get 11 ads. So, so Google and, and Microsoft being are not that different for this particular query. Now let me tell you about those 11 ads. Of those 11 ads, we actually have exactly eight of them. Um, of the eight, six of them actually got filtered out because our machine learning tells us they're not very clickable. Now that's not something that you can really validate one way or the other. And it could well be that they're clickable in Google and not so much in Internet Explorer. I mean, that's a, that's a possibility. Uh, we're pretty sure, though, that when Hal Varian on June 6th searched for this. He, by the way, owns that query. The only time it showed up in Bing in 18 months. He did it twice. Um, and uh, uh, this, so of the eight ads that showed up in, in that we have, that, that uh, all, by the way, we had over 6,000 ads were candidates for that space. So that is, we take all of the ads in the system, we figure out which ones are plausible in this situation. That produced 6,000 ads. We do a serious ranking of those 6,000. Of that, 1,837 survived. That means they survived the business logic. So for example, none of the advertisers said, 
minus roses. So if the word roses appeared, they weren't allowed to appear. That's what I mean by business logic. Almost all of those then fail on the clickability. We put a minimum standard. I expect Google does the same, that if it's, if it's uh, sufficiently unlikely to be clicked, it's not allowed to run because it's viewed as a bad user experience. Um, there were a couple of them that were out of budget and were filtered for that reason. Um, there were two that didn't uh, have broad match enabled period. So in other words, we were forbidden to match it to this query because they didn't match. Uh, but then the other six were of the of the of the Google 11 were uh, were were um, just filtered out, and I can't tell you one way or the other whether they were filtered out uh, for good reason or bad. But they were, for whatever reason, judged not to be very clickable. I mean, and actually, Hal, did you click on them? Yeah. I I heard you had nine, but I, we we had eight. Did you, did you, uh, but no, this, so when I ran this in Redmond, it was 11. Um, were they, uh, did you click on any of the ads? So, unfortunately, I got through the entire server. No, but I, on June 6th, did you click on any of the ads? <laughs> okay, so he's not going to tell us. Let me say, I'm pretty sure he didn't buy roses in, Birmingham, Alabama, which means our system was correct. <laughs> okay, let me actually turn to the serious topic, which is the uh, value of data in algorithmic search. Um, um, the first thing is, we tend to go into, as economists, we tend to think about search engines in a way that's really unfair to the search engines. The search engines map uh, billions of URLs into hundreds of billions of queries. These are astronomically complicated objects. Um, arguably, and I've, I've seen this sort of you know, formally argued, uh, they're the most complicated algorithms ever built by humans. Um, and data is used both to initialize these algorithms and to update them uh, quite frequently. But these are immensely complicated algorithms. So if you have in your mind the mental model that someone searches Taylor Swift, and in the background, some, some uh, human says, what's a good answer to Taylor Swift? You are way off base. And that's kind of what we tend to think about is crafting a good answer for specific queries, when instead these are really complicated algorithms that, that have to take lots of inputs. And as a result, you can't scale the process of hand crafting. Yes, you can answer Taylor Swift specifically because there are enough uh, such queries, but you have to automate that process. Um, so uh, the question that I want to get at is how important is data at modern web scale? And so I'm going to start out kind of with the negative case, which is we have hundreds of billions of observations. Does it, you know, what, what's another like billion or even a doubling of that? 200 billion, instead of 100 billion, you have 200 billion observations. Can that possibly matter? Another way of saying this is, is that if you think about this as a statistical model, if I have a trillion observations and a billion right-hand side variables, I still have a trillion degrees of freedom. I should be able to estimate all of those parameters with, with um, you know, six-digit uh, uh, nines on the, uh, on the accuracy. Uh, there's a, a side on this is, is that, uh, that you often hear Computer scientists talk about achieving five nines precision, by which they mean 99.999. But of course, you can also achieve five nines precision by 9.9999. Um, that's supposed to be funny, sorry. Um, OK, most queries are rare. You hear this all the time. 50% of the Bing queries were unique in 2014. Um, now, that's queries, that's not the searches, 8% of the searches, because of course Taylor Swift is one query, hundreds of thousands of searches. Uh, so, so the number of searches is always going to be less than the number of unique queries. Okay, but the thing about this is, is that doesn't actually tell you anything much about what machine learning systems do. And the reason is, I'm going to give you the specific example, one that I own, unlike Hal, who owns uh, Red Roses in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Pasadena Ethiopian restaurant. In 2014, I was the only person to search for Pasadena Ethiopian restaurant on Bing, and it gave me great results. 
and it doesn't happen to be a pa an Ethiopian restaurant in Pasadena, but it gave me uh, Ethio uh, gave me Ethiopian restaurants near Pasadena, and it gave me um, uh, Pasadena restaurants that were kind of like Ethiopian in the sense that, from an American perspective, Afghani is kind of like Ethiopia. <laughs> They weren't bad results, all of them uh, relevant to the query. How did it do that? Well, it's got tons of data on Pasadena restaurant, on restaurant, and on Ethiopian restaurant. And it's able to figure out that Yelp is an authoritative source for almost anything restaurant. So if we've got keyword matching against Yelp, we're in good shape. And so the algorithms are sufficiently complicated that you can give them queries they've never seen before, and they can still often do a good job. And that's an example. Hal already talked to you about the root n errors. Um, the, the thing about root n is, is what's the n here? And let me give you two extremes. One is, well, we've never seen Pasadena Ethiopian restaurants, so n was one. The other is, we've seen hundreds of billions of queries, so n is 100 billion or plus. And those are two extremes. The truth is going to lie somewhere in the middle, and that's what I want to get at. Um, and the, the next question is, hasn't anyone done this before? And the thing is, is that the only way you could do this is you really had to work for one of two companies. You had to work for Google or you had to work for Microsoft because you needed giant data. If you went and test this in a university scale uh, search engine, you're not actually going to get answers that are relevant to web scale data because they, you know, they, they consider a crawl of two million to be large. Okay. Um, so, so we've got some analytic problems to overcome. One is, is that uh, the data is used uh, indirectly to make the whole system get better. And so it's hard to see the direct consequences of data when it's kind of diffused throughout the system. The other uh, is, is that common queries are generally easier. Common queries, so nine of the top 10 uh, most common queries are, are navigational queries. They're things like Facebook or Google or Microsoft. Um, uh, and so those queries are typically pretty easy to answer. And in fact, it's a general property that the more common the query is, the more it's going to be just simple to answer whether you have data or not. And so if I just compare the queries about which I have lots of data to the queries I don't have very much data about, I haven't made a fair comparison because the queries I have lots of data about were easy queries. So of course we do well on those whether or not we have data. What we really need to do this perfectly is the counterfactual world where we have the same algorithm, one trained with lots of data and one trained with less data, say 10% less data. And then you could then do the fair comparison over all the queries. We're going to do a little tiny version of that, not a big version. Okay, so I'm going to do three analyses, the rare query trend. Rare query trend says, here's a query that we had never seen before or not seen very much, so we had very little data about it. And then it became more popular. And we look at how much better we get over time, with as, or really actually as a function of the data coming in. What's nice about that is approximately speaking, it holds the algorithms constant. So it's not perfectly constant because algorithms are always evolving, but, but it approximately holds the algorithms constant because mostly what's changed in the interim is the amount of data we had available on that query. We'll also look at uh, direct and indirect data. So like I said, Pasadena restaurant is indirect data for, for Pasadena Ethiopian restaurant. That's something I can measure with something called a knowledge graph. So we build a knowledge graph. That allows us to identify all the indirect data. And then we say, how many queries have little indirect data? And how much does indirect data uh, count for relative to di direct data? And that's a place where I learned something unexpected. I expected the indirect data to be worth less to the system than the direct data, but that's not what I found. What I found is, is approximately speaking, it's worth the same. And then finally, we'll look at how, does the system actually get better over time as more data flows in? And the answer to that is yes, as judged by this. The likelihood that clicks occur on higher, uh, uh, higher positions rises as the data flows in. So that's the, that's the logic. So diving right in, because I don't have very much time. Uh, and will you give me a five minute warning? Um, OK, so the rare query trend analysis, the, the, um, the, um, we're going to look at queries that hadn't occurred very much in the data and see as the data comes in, do the search engines get better? Um, 
and, and we think this should be conservative in the sense that it's understating uh, uh, the data scale effects because it's missing two things. It's missing the, the indirect data, and, and again, we will get to that, and it's also missing the sort of overall external effects uh, of the system getting better. Okay, so here's our data. Uh, we're going to use Internet Explorer logs. The beauty of Internet Explorer logs is that there are uh, as many people using Google on Internet Explorer logs as there are using uh, Bing. And as a result, we have data for both Google and Bing. Uh, we're going to take the period of January to, to March 2014 as a benchmark, and we're going to look at queries that were unpopular in the sense of being less than 200 uh, clicks during that period and became more popular in the sense of uh, at least a thousand clicks after that period. And what's nice about this is it's going to allow us to, when we look at as data comes from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 to 500 and so on, we're holding constant the set of queries. So I'm not falling prey to the problem that the, the, um, that, uh, the more popular queries might be easier. Instead, these are exactly the same set of queries. Here's two examples. Uh, Madam Secretary, which is some CBS show I'd never heard of, and Letter Garden, which is an online game, again, that I had never heard of. And what you see graphed here, uh, this is actually done by quarter, so it's done uh, on, on time throughout 2014, is what's the average click probability on the page? And in both cases, I take out clicks that are, um, that are um, w where the, the user quickly goes back. So in other words, if you click on it on something on the page and then almost immediately return to the search page, I'm going to throw those clicks away. So that those are bad clicks. Um, and so we take those clicks out. So in other words, they're clicks that lasted some period of time. And uh, what you see on the left is that, that the, the neither search engine was very good in the first quarter, and then they get uh, progressively better and roughly converge. On Letter Garden, you see them, uh, that Google has a substantial edge at the beginning, and, uh, and that gap roughly narrows, but both get better, and Google content, uh, uh, is, is better across the board. Um, now, one thing I want to emphasize here is, is that I'm using Internet Explorer, which is most of Bing's data. There are Chrome users who use, uh, who use Bing, but most, uh, and actually uh, probably Hal and I are the only two people in the room who know how many there are, um, but, but um, uh, that's most of our users. Uh, Bing's users are on Internet Explorer, whereas it's almost surely a minority of the uh, of the um, Google users. So, so we're not comparing, the one thing that's not com uh, uh, directly comparable is the amount of data, we use the same criteria but in Internet Explorer, but presumably Google has some multiple more data than, than Bing does in these, in these comparisons. Okay, so here's the, the result of that study. What you're looking at is the average, it's about 8,000 queries. Uh, that, that met this criteria, and these are showing you, uh, and I don't know if you can see out in the, in the audience, I know my eyesight is such I can barely see it from here, is both the average and the error bars, 95% uh, error bars, for uh, both Bing on the left and Google on the right. Uh, and so what this says is, so for example, Bing is doing an average of about uh, almost 67% uh, clicks when it only has 100 observations, and at 7, 8, 900, that's risen up to uh, close to 69%. You see it fall, those aren't statistically significant differences, and it would be alarming if they were, but uh, you do see it fall in that. And this is for US data only. Uh, and you see the same thing with Google. It starts a little above 70% uh, and rises up uh, above 72% uh, monotonically as the data flows in. And again, the amount of data that Google has is presumably substantially larger. This is something where I just want to be agnostic about what that means because the population of Internet Explorer users looks different than the population of Chrome or Firefox users. And there are even the handful of Opera users. And so. The, the, what does that mean for this study? It means that 
they could have, Google could have a lot more users if these queries were popular on Chrome, or a lot, not fewer than, let's say, than they, nor uh, the, but we know they have at least the number that we've graphed there, like uh, 900 on the far side. We know they have at least 900 because we saw those 900, but uh, these are clicks, by the way, rather than, uh, rather than impressions. But we don't know how many they had on Chrome, and, I, and we need to be agnostic about that. Here's the data for the EU. The uh, EU uh, Bing is rising from 71 and a half to a little uh, um, just shy of 75, and in fact is actually outperforming uh, Google on the on the uh, on these queries, at least to the in the as as the data flows in. Oops. Uh oh. Ah. Okay. Um, how much data do we have? So that's the end of that study. How much data do we actually have? 50% uh, of the queries are unique, but of course, as I said, that doesn't mean there's no data on them. And so how many queries have little relevant data? That's what I want to get at. Uh, so this is going to be a second study completely independent of the first. In fact, it's not even going to use the same data set. Uh, what we're going to do is build a knowledge graph. So a knowledge graph is a uh, set of related concepts. It dates to a paper from 2007. And we're going to only look at Bing data for this because we're going to use different logs because that was helpful for the analysis. Um, we may be able to do the same thing with the, uh, with the Internet Explorer logs, but we have not at this moment. Uh, we've only used Bing, the Bing data. So we're only doing this for Microsoft data. Okay. Um, um, we, we're gonna, th this is called a semantic graph. It says, uh, it worked, well actually let me just show the picture. Uh, let me show it to this picture first. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is the notion of the graph. So if you have, I can't pronounce the Italian, not without garbling it, but we have an Italian phrase which means Italy national football. That's got a 100% connection. Uh, these are actually the empirical numbers. If I have Antonio Conte, that shows up as a 25% connection to Italy football and so on. And we do that for the entire set of queries. How do we do that? This is the picture. Roughly speaking, what it says is this. The, the URLs are similar to each other if people who use a particular query, if the same set of queries lead to those URLs, that makes the URLs similar. And in reverse, queries are similar to each other if the same set of URLs are, respond, are valid applicable responses to those queries. So basically we're looking for a fixed point of the process that says queries are similar when they lead to the same URLs and URLs are similar when they lead to the same queries. And this is a sort of standard methodology uh, called a semantic graph or a knowledge graph uh, and it dates from this paper in KDD 2007. Uh, so, so that's what we've done to produce that. Now let me emphasize there are, you know, what's it mean to be similar? Effectively, I've got a dial, and we tried dialing this to different levels, and, and uh, we did a certain amount of eyeballing to, to say as, we, as you increase the dial, so you make the standards more rigorous, you lose connections. As you decrease the dial, you gain some spurious connections, and so you want to be somewhere in the middle, and then we did the robustness test. And everything I have to say survives pretty far moving the dial either direction. Okay. Um, we, we started with 100 billion searches. That, that 100 billion searches has 4.5 billion queries. That is things that, you know, the Red Roses in Birmingham, Alabama. The queries that could be clustered, not every query could be clustered. Some of them didn't cluster to anything. That is, we didn't find anything that connects that query to another query. That was almost half the total queries that had that property. We've set those aside. So we're not going to draw any conclusions from those because we don't know why we failed to connect them. Could be we failed to connect them because we didn't have very much data, which you can see. It was 42% of the queries and 7.7% of the data. So maybe we just didn't have enough data. Um, or it could be that they were really just one-off. Somebody searched for something that nobody else was interested in. Uh, so we don't really have a good answer to that. Um, so here's queries with the, so here's the out, outcome of this. Queries that are, so, so what you're looking at here is 
on the, on the vertical, on the horizontal axis is the number of direct searches for that query. So it ranges from uh, one all the way up to 10 to the seventh. Uh, this is in log scale. So for example, is this a, hey, it is. Oh, but I'm really afraid to touch it here. So here you're looking at a thousand uh, direct searches on this vertical line and then most of what you're seeing, what we've graphed, so a circle is how many are in that spot, in that, in that cluster. So what you're seeing is there's a really big, actually I think I even, let's see if I can do this. Uh, no, it's not this picture, sorry. Uh, you see a lot, and then what's, what's on the vertical axis is the total viewpoint, so that's direct plus indirect queries, the ones that are linked to them. And so, for example, queries up here, even though they were only searched a thousand times, which isn't very much, not a whole lot of data according to the first study, What we're because uh, the system's still getting better at 1,000, what we're seeing is up there, there's tons of indirect data. So think Pasadena Ethiopian restaurant, tons of indirect data. Anytime the query ends in restaurant, that's going to be connected to other restaurant queries and there's lots of indirect data. This giant pile here are things where the direct data and the indirect data look really close. And remember, I've thrown out the ones I couldn't link. So I've thrown out almost half the queries, or well, 42% of them total. This is the graph both in query space and in uh, view space of the uh, total uh, number direct and indirect. So for example, if I say here, I've got uh, roughly 10% of the queries and 17% of the uh, 17% of the searches have uh, very little indirect data. I got that backwards. 17% of the queries, 10% of the searches have 1,000 or less uh, indirect data. And so that's the sort of the answer to that. Now, uh, a couple of other things we can do with this. Uh, we can look at how data accumulates over time because we have this January, February, March, April, and so on. So we actually, we, we took queries that were never occurred in 2013 and asked how, uh, how well did we do in 2014 as more data came in. So these are queries that seem to be brand new. Here's some examples, Minecraft, Minecraft Miniplex, Despicable Me Training Wheels, uh, iPad Air Pictures, uh, iPad Air was new at that time. So, so these are examples of queries. Again, nothing happened in 2013 and then in 2014 we start seeing uh, a substantial number. This is what happens over time to the graph. So uh, initially you don't have very much data, it's all disconnected. Over time it gets more and more connected because you learn that things were connected you didn't know. And that's part of the process of machine learning. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip through this. This is Direct, indirect views are predicted by direct views. Um, uh, no, so this is not, this is actually an important slide. So, so this is, uh, how does indirect and direct matter towards our ability to predict? And what you see here is, in fact, indirect had a slightly higher coefficient, but statistically they, uh, the uh, neighborhoods interlap, uh, overlap. So direct and indirect actually have about the same implication. So that justifies putting those on the same axis. Uh, that is to say, adding the direct and the indirect is that approximately speaking, they both contribute uh, uh, successfully. Uh, indirect, is actually, indirect is actually predicted pretty closely by direct. That's the thing I want to skip. Um, so so um, uh, this says the same thing as we get more data. Uh, we get better, but this actually says it a different way. It says as we get more data, the probability of a the, the location of the clicks rises. So that is to say the average rank, so this is one for the first position, two for the second position, three for the third position, that variable rises in meaning the number, the, the value of the number falls because it gets closer to one as more data becomes and that's, you know, whenever you do data uh, uh, analysis with this level of, of uh, data you get uh, wild statistical significance. So we are getting better as more data becomes available. One question we were asked actually it was the attorneys that asked this, didn't occur to us which is embarrassing, um, is, is it only, could it be the content that's getting better? Maybe the content's getting better and the search engine is staying the same. 
Well, what we found is, is that uh, both Bing and, and Google have high 90 percentiles for, uh, for the URLs already existing. That's true in both the US and the EU. And, um, and uh, the, the likelihood of a click on position number one rises and on all the other positions falls. And that suggests that actually either, it still doesn't quite rule out that click, that position number one is just getting better, that is whatever is in there, it became more clickable, like it changed its text or something. But, um, but it, uh, what we're seeing is the, what it looks like is the search engine's doing a better job at putting position number one, uh, putting the right result in position number one as we get more data. Okay, so we did three separate analyses that I want to emphasize. Uh, one is we, we looked at the effect of data on new queries and we found that both Google and Bing are getting better uh, as more data comes in. We looked at related Related queries, we did a knowledge, you know, a industry standard knowledge graph and looked at how related queries data matters. We find that it does matter. We also find that it's not a cure in the sense that there are still a substantial number of queries for which we do not have lots of data. And then finally, we showed that the URL position rises as you uh, get more data. Okay. Um, so the fact that there are unlimited degrees of freedom, what goes wrong with this? It's the scale of the problem. Yes, we have unlimited degrees of freedom, but we also have a problem which, whose scale is uh, matching billions of, of uh, websites to hundreds of billions of, of queries, so there's like 10 to the 20th possibilities. The scale of the problem is very large, and that's what makes it so hard, and that's why more data continues to be valuable, even at this giant scale. Okay, this is the former logo of Thomson Reuters. And once you look at that as a Venn diagram, it's really hard not to look at it as a Venn diagram. Uh, <laughs> and with that, I will uh, sit down. <laughs>